Welcome to the, uh, the Thursday's live session for JuliaCon 2020. Um, first up, we have Jeff and Stefan, who really need no introduction, talking about the state of Julia in 2020. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, so we're, we're going to give what, uh, it's actually the first time we've done something that's officially called the state of Julia. But we figured it's been a couple of years since 1.0, which sort of had a not not called as such, but very big state of Julia where we announced and released uh, Julia 1.0. So we're just going to look back at, you know, some of the things that have happened since 1.0, what's uh, what the big developments in the ecosystem and the language have been. Um, and also look forward to <clears throat> what we have coming down the pipeline in the, you know, near near and slight, slightly less further into the future. Um, and uh, so let's start with where we've been, past, present, and future. Um, and Jeff is going to talk about multi-threading. OK, so uh, multi-threading has been kind of one of the big arcs of the project. Uh, initially, we didn't have any uh, for several versions. Uh, and then in 0 0.5, we started adding a little bit. Uh, we had a simple loop parallel model at first, uh, just flat parallelism. Uh, and then just last year, really, we announced an entirely new model based on spawn weight, uh, which is a composable model. Composability, of course, is very important to us. You know, I, I often read that word as compostable, which is, you know, it's almost the same thing if you think about it. <laughs> but uh, so we, uh, we've, been, we've been working on this. Uh, it's starting to get quite widely used. I think over the past year, it's gotten a lot more solid. Um, and one, one of the uh, pieces of progress over time has been trying to reduce the overhead of the scheduler. Uh, in many ways, the scheduling overhead kind of limits uh, what kinds of applications you can do and how much scalability you get uh, and sort of where this will be applicable. So I think it's going to be important to reduce the overhead over time. Um, we haven't actually yet put a, a very large concerted effort into this, but we've been kind of chipping away at it part time. Uh, and you can see uh, where we've come since last year. Uh, so on a couple of simple micro benchmarks, just doing a bunch of spawn weight pairs uh, or then doing the parallel uh, tree recursive Fibonacci, uh, we've come down about uh, 15, 20 percent. Uh, so it's not bad progress so far, but we'll be doing a lot more of this. All right. Uh, so moving on to Julia Hacker News and Twitter bingo topics. Uh, this is something I think about every day. I worry about it every day. Uh, people are always talking about the latencies that you get in Julia. The infamous time to first plot problem. Um, so this is something we've been focusing on a lot, actually. Um, there actually has been quite a concerted effort uh, in, the, in recent months uh, to try to address this. Uh, and this is, this is not a small problem. This is not something where we can just kind of go in and fix the bug. Um, it's um, it has to, many many things have to be done some small some big uh, on many different levels uh, so if you look at the latency label uh, on GitHub which this label hasn't actually existed very long uh, but you can see there uh, over the past I don't know year or so uh, 66 PRs uh, have gone in related to that uh, this is actually an underestimate I realized that uh, you know we're, we're not perfect about tagging things so it's actually a few more than that. Um, but so it's been quite quite a few different things had to be done to try to try to work on this. Um, so let's look at where we've where we've been. Uh, you can see uh, for several versions, basically nothing changed. So from from 1.0 to 1.4, you can tell we weren't working on it pretty much by work uh, by looking at this graph. Uh, and in fact, un unfortunately, it looks like 1.4 got a little bit slower. Uh, so sorry about that. Uh, that's that's unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, it hasn't hadn't really improved. And then you can see uh, that in 1.5, there are, are the fruits uh, of our efforts. Uh, so that, that time is now starting to come down significantly. Uh, and master is even a little bit better. Uh, so we are chipping away at this as well. Uh, so this is there's there's good progress happening here. And I, I want to point out that this uh, time to first plot is sort of a worst case here. There's a lot of other load times that have gotten substantially better than this because they're they're not quite as complicated and involved and they don't involve quite pulling so many pieces together. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about the debugger because you know this has been sort of uh, one of those 
you know, bullet points that uh, everyone seems to want for, uh, for a programming language. And I can understand that. I love using a good debugger as well. Um, and technically we've had a debugger since 2017. In November, 2017, the first release of Gallium uh, came out. Um, so Gallium was the, the code name for a LLVM based, you know, sort of GDB or LLDB style debugger that Keno Fisher worked on. Uh, he spent a huge amount of time and energy on this. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, his quote, he, he was commenting on uh, the new debugger on, we got made it on Hacker News and he wrote, wrote this comment the whole comment is actually really interesting. I think it's the most self-reflective about what, what went wrong with Gallium. Um, but this was his statement about it. Um, and I, I think, you know, it, it, it was a great effort. We learned a lot. We got a lot of great technology, but it was ultimately a little bit too ambitious and ended up not being as useful as we wanted it to be. Um, <clears throat> but fortunately, um, Keno's great work was taken over and advanced further by other people, Chris Carlson, Christopher Carlson, Tim Holy, Sebastian Fitzner. Um, and debugger.jl was released last year. Um, and so this steps back and takes a much simpler approach. Uh, it's interpreter based, which means it's slow, but it's very, very reliable, very straightforward. You know, things work the way you intuitively think they should work, which if you understand anything about the internals of a compiled programming language, things don't actually work the way you intuitively think they work. They're just carefully arranged to make it look like that's what's happening. Um, but in debugger jail, it actually is doing the naive thing that you think it should should be doing. Um, <clears throat> it's very full featured. It can do all sorts of different things and it's really reliable. So those are the sort of three features that make it actually a very useful debugger. Um, the big problem with it is just that because it's based on an interpreter, it's pretty slow. So if you have to run a lot of code that you know, is computationally intensive or even just does a lot of IO um, to get to the point where you want to be debugging, uh, that can take a really long time. And so that's a, that's a stumbling block for a lot of people. Uh, but we're hopeful about improvements, ways to improve that. We're actually gonna try to schedule a meeting of, of sort of the, uh, the people who are, have their fingers in this pie uh, for next week and hopefully we'll make some progress. Uh, and you can see the really nice UI for the debugger on the right-hand side. I think this is in, is this VS Code or is this uh, Juno? I'm not sure. It's one of, this one is, of this the This is Juno. This is Juno, okay. Um, so both Juno and VS Code uh, have a really nice debug uh, you know, U, UI for this type of thing. Um, so one of the big advances in Julia 1.0 was the package manager. So there was a total rewrite uh, and we went from having a sort of traditional, relatively run-of-the-mill package manager like what you'd find in, you know, Ruby or Perl or, uh, or you know, Python, although, you know, built in and standard, so that, that's an improvement over some of those systems. Um, this was called PKG3, so if you ever see that, that's what it's referring to, third generation rewrite of this. And the, the high-level concepts are, you know, just out of the box provide per project environment so that when you're working on one project, uh, you can have one set of versions of all your dependencies. And when you switch to another project, that isn't dictated. You know, it isn't dictated that you have to use the exact same set of versions because why, why would that be necessary? Um, also, being able to record all your dependencies was a huge deal. That's a big, a big goal of the, the system. Um, and then also track them in version control so that you know what you were using in the past, potentially. Um, and then also to make it reproducible forever. So, you know, you record this information and it shouldn't depend on some, some other third, you know, third piece of information that, uh, that can change over time. Um, so in Julia 1.0, the way this was accomplished was with uh, project and manifest files. Um, and they together record the full dependency graph of, you know, Julia packages for your entire application. Um, and this has been wildly successful. People can email you know, manifest files around to each other to get the same in setup in, you know, in uh, exact same setup environment and test things out and reproduce bugs. Um, you can check your manifest file into, into the, the version control of your project and reproduce exactly how it was working. And uh, today we have, you know, in this new system, 4,000, 4, I think we hit 4,000 yesterday, uh, registered packages. Um, so that's, you know, really exciting. Uh, in 1.3, we introduced a new concept, which is artifacts. And then uh, binary builder is a way to produce artifacts for, uh, for, you know, 
platform specific uh, binaries and libraries. And this extends our tracking of the full dependency graph and reproducibility all the way down to the binary dependency level. And that's been wildly successful. Um, we've sort of gone from a situation where it's pretty common where for people to try to build libraries on their clients and it just doesn't work for whatever reason to, you know, things just work because all, all these uh, binary builder artifacts do is they're just tarballs that unpack and they should, should work on your system. Um, and now, I mean, we've had huge, huge progress in I think less than a year we now have 470 binaries wrapped, which is which is huge. We're, we're well on our way to having our own sort of uh, cross-platform Linux distribution going on here. Uh, Julia 1.4 introduced something called the package protocol, which wasn't on by default in 1.4. So I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Um, the ecosystem has come a huge way in the same amount of time. Uh, I think my one of my favorite recent examples uh, is csv.jl, which went from sort of an underdog CSV parser uh, in the in the grand scheme of things to now being best in class. Like it's the it's the fastest CSV parser in the world for for most uh, CSV use cases. Um, and it's multi-threaded, which I'm very proud of. Yeah. And uh, it, it's and Jacob great. Quinn should be proud of. Yeah. Well, it's great to see the way that has panned out, right? Like Jacob was able to take CSV and relatively easy to easily turn it multi-threaded by using the infrastructure that you and Jameson created for, for threading. Um, the SciML org for using differentiable programming to do machine learning in, in scientific applications seems to be growing exponentially. Um, they already have, you know, nine, 95 repos in their GitHub org, which is you know, just incredible. Um, yeah, it's it's huge. I mean, it's more than Julia Lang. It's it's more than a lot of things. Yeah, it's it's really incredible. It's really an epic project. Um, and there was a great talk, great talk about it yesterday, uh, which I encourage people to check out. Um, there was also a talk about Juno and VS Code yesterday that Sebastian gave. Um, they've joined forces. Is the short 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 story? Um, VS Code is going to be the future because, uh, um, you know. Microsoft has has purchased GitHub, GitHub, and so uh, at the Atom editor is kind of, you know, winding down, and VS Code seems to be the the way to go. Yeah, um, I'm 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 very excited about this because you know for a while now we've actually had two good IDEs, you know, Juno and VS Code uh, for Julio were each independently quite good, um, and so to to hear that those two teams are going to be working together uh, on a common system is just incredibly exciting because I I can only imagine. Uh, where that's going to go. It's, it's, it's going to be amazing, I think. Yeah, I, I agree that uh, no longer splitting our forces uh, on, in the IDE front is going to be, is going to be a powerful force, I think. Um, these days, you can actually, you know, people are writing, what, you know, serving websites and writing servers in, in Julia, that's a thing. Um, I've written several myself, the, you know, the, the server component of the package protocol is written in, in pure Julia. Um, and uh, you know the, the core library there is HTTP, but there's great frameworks on top of that, like Genie and Franklin. Um, all of the Julia docs for Julia itself and for a lot of packages are generated in Franklin. Um, it's a really, really great system. Um, and I, I was pretty frustrated in the past with Jekyll, so it's really nice to have a system that just works and also you know, bonus that it's written in Julia. Um, there's a great talk yesterday about uh, Pluto.jl so that's a new new notebook uh, system. So, so I kind of think similar to Jupyter, but with a uh, a reactive programming model, which basically means uh, that's too too hard to explain here. But it's uh, similar to observable notebooks, if anybody has heard of those. So it's a very cool to bit of technology. Um, the GPU system has gotten you know more and more robust and mature. Um, it, I think one of the big developments there is that now you can install the GPU drivers more, like more easily in Julia than anywhere else, because it uses all of that uh, that whole artifact system. Um, so now you can just sort of you know in, install CUDA packages and you have a working, you know, GPU driver immediately, which is kind kind of mind blowing, honestly. Um, JuliaHub.com is a is a site offered by Julia Computing, and you know today it's really m mostly a place to find and search Julia packages. You can have search by code and all sorts of other stuff. But in the near future, we're going to allow you to develop your code locally, and then 
you know, just click a button to run it in the cloud. Um, which, uh, for example, in the Julia computing demo yesterday, Matt Matt Bauman gave a demo where, uh, you know, he had he had you know run some alpha alpha zero code locally, which would have taken a day or something like that, and then you know he ran it on a beefy beefy GPU machine in the cloud, and it trained in like two hours, which is pretty amazing. Um, uh, I think this is this is Jeff's you know most favorite recent discovery, which is that there's a Julia typeface. Yeah, I, th I think this is super cool. I mean, this is, I, I, th I just think it's cool. It's something I never thought, you know, I would, I would see. Uh, I, st I immediately started trying to use it right away and I've, I've already filed an issue. Uh, so you can do that. It's pretty cool to be able to file a, an issue on a typeface and, on GitHub. So I'm, I, this is just a fun thing. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of recency bias uh, in this list. Uh, I, I put some things on here based on just what I've seen at, at JuliaCon already, uh, which you can probably tell, uh, but there's, you know, but it, it, it's, it, we need some way to create a small sample of, of what's happened because it's, it's just so, so much. So this is really just a small, you know, small biased sample. Mm -hmm. Was it a kerning bug? Was that your issue that you filed? Ah, uh, no, no, it's not. But <laughs> you can go, go check it out on, on the repo. <laughs> yeah. All right. So where are we now? What's the, the current state of affairs? Well, you know, one v, version 1.5 is nearly out. The second release candidate is already out. So please try it and, you know, report any issues you find. Hopefully there are no showstopper issues and, you know, the second release candidate might actually end up being the final version. Yeah, I have, I have high hopes that RC2 will become a uh, final sometime, maybe early next week. Fingers yeah, crossed. It's been, a, it's been a very smooth release so far. So fingers crossed, this is this might be the last one. Okay, so there's been you know a little bit of progress on multi-threading. You want to talk about it a bit? Yeah, sure. So I'll I'll say also at a, at a high level, I think you know since we've been doing timed releases, uh, we never know exactly what we're going to get uh, in any given release. And I think you know what 1.4 was fine, uh, but if you if you browse through the release notes, it's not really very big. It's sort of a, it's a ho-hum release. Solid, but you know, not that much that's very exciting. Uh, 1.5, I think, is really, really different. There's a, a lot of really great stuff in, in 1.5. Uh, so it's it's going to be great, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. multi-threading. Um, there aren't there aren't really any many new features. There are a couple new features, actually. Uh, but we're basically declaring parts of the API uh, to be stable. And we instead of just saying it's experimental, you know, don't use it. Instead, we've gone through and tried to carefully document, you know, where all the, the sharp sharp edges are, um, so that it, you know we can signal that it's really ready to be used. Because really, a lot of people are starting to use it. Uh, okay. So now, one thing I hear a lot, a question I get a lot is, you know, is Julia as fast as C plus uh, plus? And if not, why not? Um, and so there, there are a couple reasons. So first, of course, it depends what you're doing. I mean, some, sometimes it is as fast as C++. Um, um, handful of reasons why Julia might be kind of generally slower uh, than C++. Uh, and one of them, of course, is heap allocation. Uh, like most high-level languages, Julia will tend to heap allocate a lot more objects than a C or C++ program. Uh, but not anymore. So we have a really nice optimization in 1.5 uh, that eliminates pretty large class of uh, struct heap allocations. Uh, so for instance, in this example, uh, just a micro benchmark, uh, I have an array of arrays, and then I do a product iterator of that. Uh, so I take all combinations of those arrays uh, and collect them. And so in 1.4, uh, we had to allocate uh, all of those tuples. So that allocates a million tuples. Uh, it takes a bit of time. In 1.5, those allocations are gone. Uh, we have O of 1 allocations, and it's seven times faster. Uh, so this is just fantastic. Uh, this, this is going to really help, uh, help a lot of abstractions work with no overhead. Uh, this also affects array views a lot uh, and subarrays. Uh, so you can kind of use those without fear now. Uh, and just a, it's a whole category of abstraction overhead uh, that is gone. And I have to thank uh, Jameson Nash for doing a lot of the work on this uh, and relational.ai, which sponsored this work because uh, they, they recognized uh, how, you know, how important uh, a category of abstraction overhead this was to remove. Uh, so they, they sponsored this project and, and it's done and it's in 1.5. I, I think the true sign of this being an epic transformation in the language um, 
which sounds like a big deal, but the key, the key, the, my criteria for that is that it eliminates a whole class of workarounds, right? In the past, we've sort of had these, these watershed moments in the language, like when functional programming, higher order functions became efficient, suddenly people stopped doing all these workarounds and just started using higher order programming without fear. And I think this allows us to do, you know, view oriented programming without having to worry about the performance implications. And that really, that, that changes the feel of the language in a way that I think people are only starting to realize with the, when they're using 1.5. Um, another big change, uh, well, so, you know, 1.0 had a lot of changes. Most of them were pretty well received. I, I'd say almost all. There was one that was not so popular. Um, so you can see a demo here of it in the Julia REPL. You assign you know, to an accumulator the value zero, and then you try to accumulate to it in a for loop, uh, and you get this inscrutable error message, S not defined. Okay, well, what, what, why, why does this not work? Well, it's obvious to us looking at this little bit of code that this ought to update S, um, but you know, coming up with lang language rules for these things that work well in all cases uh, is not so simple. Um, we used to use a heuristic for this in pre 1.0 that worked pretty well, but you know, it actually caused a lot of bugs because you know, sometimes these statements are pretty far removed from each other. They might be in different files. Um, it's often the case that you kind of, you know, you assign temper to a, a variable name like S in a for loop and actually you just only use it inside of the loop iteration. But if there happens to be an unrelated variable named S that's global, um, this could cause bugs. And that's not hypothetical, it actually did. We, when we changed this in 1.0, we discovered a huge number of bugs, both in base Julia and in packages. Um, so fixing this was good, but it's really annoying. Um, people find this, you know, they want this to just work in the REPL. Um, they're confused when they encounter it. So we've, we've had a lot of back and forth about this. Um, so now in 1.5, here's what happens. In the REPL, it just does what you, what you want it to do. Um, so that, you know, that inconvenience is gone. You can cut and paste from inside a function body into the REPL and it just works. Um, however, you know, we don't want to break code that's out there. And also we like the fact that um, you don't accidentally clobber globals if you, you know, assign to them inside of a for loop in some other file or wherever, some later in the same file. So in a file, you get this very clear warning that says, uh, that, that this situation is ambiguous. Um, and the reason it's ambiguous is because, you know, it's unclear whether the inner loop, the, the S inside the loop should be a new local or uh, overwrite the global. So now you, you have a warning and you have to say either that it is explicitly a local S or a global S to, to silence the warning. Um, so what we like about this new design is that it, it, it recovers the, the convenience and usability of the pre 1.0 behavior that peop some people remember, um, but it also retains the 1.0 safety against accidentally clobbering go globals. So we sort of get the both, both best of both worlds here. Um, the only downside really being that it's a little complex and it's a little annoying that it you know is slightly different in the fi in a file or REPL, but I think this is a really good compromise. Um, and you know, I I, I want to add also that that was uh, that was quite a long and you know I, I don't I don't know if I should say agonizing but uh, design process. We really went through a lot of possible ideas and alternatives, and you know, for a, for about I don't know about a year, you know, quite regularly, Stefan would slack me. Okay, Jeff, it's time to talk about the scope issue again. And oh, yeah, I can I can tell you were dreading that every time I was like <laughs> talk about the scope issue. <laughs> So it's it was it was quite a quite a drawn out process to to get there, but I think well, it came you, out the right you also, way. You prototyped you you had a fully working PR of a prototype of a totally different solution. Yeah, we fully prototyped one at least one or two yeah different full approaches yeah. Which we decided was too complicated and too hard to understand, um, and I, I, I you know I think that was worth exploring, but I'm glad we went with the way we did because I think this is much simpler and clearer. Yeah. Okay, so in another, we talked about the package protocol a little bit earlier. So in earlier Julia's package, the package manager just downloaded packages from wherever they're hosted, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, personal servers. It, I mean, it can really be, it's usually on GitHub, but it can in theory be anywhere. So if you, if you need to access all of the registered packages, you potentially are talking to any server anywhere on the internet. Um, 
you know, it can potentially use different protocols, the Git protocol, SSH, you know, plain HTTP, secure HTTP. Um, you know, this was like a really practical way to bootstrap things and get things going, but uh, it's actually not super right, super great in, in the long term. Um, so here are some of the issues. So the worst one, I think, is probably that resources can just go away. So, you know, if people remember the left pad incident in the NPM JavaScript world, uh, if someone deletes a package from GitHub, then, you know, it's just gone and nobody can install it. So that's that's not great. Um, we also don't get any download stats. So that's that's unfortunate because it would be nice to know what packages people are installing and using. Um, it's tightly coupled with GitHub and Git. You know, there's a lot of features that GitHub pa hosted packages get that other ones don't. And, uh, you know, also it's sort of inherently tied with the Git protocol, which is unfortunate too, because people sometimes develop things using non-Git uh, version control systems. Uh, terrible, you know, terrible for firewalls and sysadmins because you're potentially talking, you know, all these different protocols to all these different servers. Um, and finally, it's, you know, bad for, speed and bandwidth. Uh, you know, if you're in North America, it's pretty okay. But, uh, you know, I've heard of, you know, horror stories of people in China or Australia taking tens of minutes to update their packages, which is really, you know, unacceptable. We want everyone everywhere to have good performance. Uh, so the solution is this thing called the package protocol. And it's just a really simple HTTPS protocol for package clients to get resources that they need to install packages. Um, and you can see a little sort of, you know, this is what the HTTP requests look like. It's pretty straightforward. I gave a talk about it yesterday with Elliot. So check that out if you're interested in more detail. Um, and in Julia 1.5, this is now the default. This is how people by default uh, get their packages. They talk to a server called pkg.julialang.org. Um, and it's, you know, it's not a real website. It's just a, just a resource server. Uh, and the server side is implemented uh, in Julia. It's open source. You can see it in the URL here. So, you know, check it out if you're interested. Um, and we operate a network of these around the world. Uh, so here's a little map. Um, and there are, there are 10 package servers, which are the red, the red and the green are both package servers. And then there's a thing called a storage server, which is basically a, uh, a per persistence layer behind the package servers, which are just caches. And we have two of those. Uh, on opposite ends of the of the of the, the planet, um, so the, this is probably going to grow. We want to cover the entire world, but it depends on uh, where AWS offers certain services. Um, so as soon as that expands, we'll we'll be everywhere. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the future. Um, yeah, so latency is still a problem. Uh, you know, we we don't think by any means that ten seconds to six seconds is victory. It's nice, but you know, we need, we need to do even better. Uh, so there are actually a lot of tricks still left in the bag. We haven't done uh, everything we can possibly do. Uh, we can make the JIT compiler lazier. Uh, we can try to make the interpreter faster and use it more instead of taking the time to compile things. Um, we still don't cache native code for packages, so we could potentially do that. Uh, and recently, Tim Holey has taken on the role of invalidation czar, who's trying to reduce uh, the number of times we recompile things, uh, which is another uh, source of latency. So there are a lot of things that are, uh, we can still do and are still ongoing to improve this. Uh, task and thread system uh, is still getting a lot of work. Uh, overhead has come down, but needs to come down a lot more. I'm hoping we can do more of a concerted effort on that uh, in the next uh, year or two. Uh, we're thinking about better debugging features uh, to make it easier to see what's happening if your tasks are stuck uh, or something goes wrong. Uh, control C is always a, a big problem. You know, in, in a program, you try to reason about which sections can't throw exceptions, can't be interrupted. Uh, if you have Control C, everything can be interrupted. It sort of makes it impossible to program on, on some level. Uh, but we're, we're going to try to improve it as, as much as we can. Uh, there are a lot of discussions about different concurrency primitives. Uh, context variables. Uh, Takafumi has a, a whole a really interesting set of ideas about this uh, where there's a lot of discussion going on. Uh, and we still need to uh, integrate with uh, multi-threaded BLAST. So we've done that for FFTW uh, because Steve Johnson was able to help with that, but we haven't done it for BLAST, something we need to do. Um, and we've also uh, focused so far on throughput essentially, uh, but we need to uh, do more to help uh, latency bound workloads and like in, uh, working with working better with uh, you know GUIs and real time kind of stuff. Uh, there's also a lot of compiler work happening. So 
Uh, we have kind of a goal of making the compiler uh, more extensible and reusable. Uh, there have been kind of some experiments and kind of special case projects over the years, uh, like the GPU compiler is one of the best examples uh, of something that kind of tries to reuse and retarget uh, the Julia compiler. That's been kind of a pioneering project uh, for generalizing the compiler, but we need to we need to make that sort of more generally uh, usable so we can bring more kinds of alternate backends online and we can do more things with code. Um, so cassette.jl <clears throat> uh, was another kind of very important uh, uh, concept uh, that was invented to kind of realize uh, the compiler and be able to, to rewrite code in various ways. Uh, so we're currently looking at, uh, Kano mostly has been working on uh, a way to sort of generalize uh, the compiler uh, and make it e easier to do these kinds of things. Uh, and we have target use cases like uh, better automatic differentiation uh, and such. Uh, we've also just barely started thinking about, and there's there's been no work done on this really yet, but it's just kind of an idea uh, that I'm very interested in, uh, which is to basically add some sort of a separate compilation model to the language, uh, which you can think of as being a bit like package compiler uh, except you can compile multiple things uh, just like you would from C++, make multiple .so files, uh, and you can have something like a header file and, and have them link against each other. Uh, so more of a traditional kind of separate compilation model, I think is something we can add to the language and should. Uh, haven't started on it yet, but I would, it's something I'd like to do. Um, so there, we're not done with the package manager features. Uh, 1.6 will include actually a pretty, pretty big, significant list of uh, improvements. Um, some, some due to me, but most of these are actually uh, Elliot Saba's work. Um, and and if, again, if you want more detail, we gave a talk yesterday. Um, but so you know, we send resources from the package server to the package client. Uh, but you know, you can do that faster if you know what the package client already has you can send a diff instead of sending the whole thing. So that'll give people faster updates. Um, currently artifacts, uh, binary artifacts have a slight problem with load time. Um, basically we end up loading them all right up front, which takes a while and isn't necessary all the time. Uh, so he's reworking the way artifacts, binary artifacts get loaded so that, you know, your Julia packages will load faster, which, you know, nobody's gonna argue with obviously. Um, Scratch spaces and preferences are basically two features designed around avoid, avoiding having to mutate the state of the package itself. So some packages kind of use their own, their own directories as a scratch space, a place to like save some data that they've downloaded or whatever. But that's not great because you want your packages to be perfectly immutable and perfectly reproducible. So scratch spaces are a first class um, way of providing packages with a little bit of, of room for mutable state that it's okay if it goes away because they can reconstruct it. Um, and preferences are just a way to globally configure your packages on a system. So this all brings us to, um, you know, what, what's next. Uh, and basically the, the, the thing we've realized is that, you know, the king is dead here. Julia 1.0 is a little bit past its prime. Um, it's still perfectly usable, but it's getting really hard to support it for new packages because there's just too many new language features that we've introduced since 1.0. Um, and it's also, you know, on our end, getting really hard to backport fixes to it, right? So we have, we have fixes for known bugs, um, but we fix things on master. And then, you know, if the difference between master and one, the 1.0 branch, it's gotten pretty, pretty huge at this point. So it's really, really hard to backport fixes. Um, so it really seems like it's time for a new LTS. And so we're officially announcing that uh, Julia 1.6 will be the new long-term support version of Julia. Um, one little detail here is that 1.0 will remain LTS until we branch for 1.7. Uh, and the reason for that is that we always have two active backport branches. So if 1.6 was the, the LTS when it came, right when it came out, then we'd only have one backport branch, which is not how we want this to work. So 1.0 will remain the LTS and keep getting backports until we branch for 1.7 and then 1.6 will become the new, new LTS. Um, so because of this, we're gonna slightly change the way we do releases. We've been doing timed releases and the system that we've co converged on is that we 
we time the, the feature branch. So basically we say no new features on this release um, and that's timed. And then it takes however long it takes to stabilize it and release it. So, you know, you can't, you can't rush, the, rush the release. If there are bugs, there are bugs, they have to be fixed. Um, but what you can time is you can time when you say no, no new features on this branch. Um, but for 1.6, we're not gonna be doing that exactly. So we're still gonna try to keep it on schedule, but you know, we will wait for necessary features to be ready um, because this is gonna be the, the version that we have to live with for a fairly long time into the future. So if you can think of it like a little mini, mini version of the 1.0 release, not as, not as many things and not as you know, much pressure, but um, we, we really, you know, we, we want to get this one right. Um, Overall, I feel like there's been amazing progress and there's, you know, even more exciting things coming down the pipeline. Um, I, I really want to emphasize that, you know, this is not our work. This is the work of the community. Uh, so many people, some of whom we've mentioned in this talk, um, others who we haven't mentioned, but, you know, the bulk of this is done by, you know, hundreds and hundreds and maybe even more people who do incredible work throughout the community. Yeah, so Julia language itself, for example, passed a thousand contributors not long ago. Yeah, that's a pretty pretty great milestone. Yeah, so thank you, all thousand of you. <laughs> um, and and our ability to work on Julia, uh, you know, and you know, make it what it is, and contribute to all the open source projects that we we get to contribute to, is made possible by our company, uh, which we founded. But you know, it still makes it possible. Uh, it's Julia Computing. Um, and so, you know, check out the sponsor talk from yesterday. It's an actual technical talk about Alpha Zero. So it's pretty, it is actually interesting. It's not the usual, uh, you know, marketing only stuff. Uh, you know, the products, you, you can read them here, uh, but there's going to be a demo uh, tomorrow at 7.45 p.m. GMT, which I'm not going to try to translate that to EDT or whatever, but you can figure it out yourself. Um, and always, you know, chat with us. Uh, there's a Julia Computing channel on Discord, um, or you know, the Julia Computing website has a has a chat box. Uh, thank you all for watching. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for for attending this. And I think we have time for some questions. Yep. Uh, thanks again, uh, Jeff and Stefan. So, I've got one question from Discord. Um, in the tasks improvement work. Um, I don't see a tasks priorities or support for a main thread. Is this covered in the bullet for latency bound workloads? In particular, um, just as an example, in Jacob's microservices workshop, he created his own scheduler specifically to avoid starving the HTTP server task. Uh, yeah, so I, I think some of that would hopefully be addressed by the, the latency part of it. Uh, I don't know if it would be implemented by like explicitly selectable priorities, like numbered priorities. I don't know if that will be part of it, but I think the, the, the latency uh, stuff will address that, yeah. Right. So one question I had, um, given how Julia is designed, um, what do you think is the best you can do about compile time? So what is the best case scenario in terms of um, you know, of course, you need to you need to um, you know run run type inference and everything, right? Uh, when when you run the code for the first time. So, what is the best case scenario that we can expect? Um, uh, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I think another factor of two is definitely achievable. I but I think that's using sort of specific, you know, specifically the approach of how fast when you make the compiler. There's all sorts of tricks that can be done beyond that, right? Like you can, for example, have already compiled the thing and then people don't care about latency. Um, so that's yeah. the separate compilation work would address that angle. Um, you know, there's Although other most, most of Julia can't, can't really be separately compiled the way people use it. Uh, so the, the latency, uh, the compile latency stuff, I think is going to continue to be important. Uh, but yeah, so things like caching native code uh, could, could potentially reduce it quite a bit. Uh, I mean, there's also, we currently are in ahead of time JIT compiler. Um, that's not necessary. You know, a lot of JIT systems don't do it that way. They, they actually interpret immediately until the compiled code is ready. And then, you know, you basically get the best of both worlds, but at the cost of uh, unpredictable compute, you know, 
a less predictable compute model, but uh, that's, you know, that's always a thing that could possibly happen in the fullness of time. Yeah, and we can have a switch to turn that on and off if, it, uh, you know, if it's not good for some workloads. Yeah. But yeah, quite a bit is possible. Yeah, all right. Um, all all yeah, is possible yeah, so. with enough time and money. <laughs> well, thanks again, uh, Steph and Jeff, uh, Jeff and Stefan, for <laughs> for a great talk. Um, I think Stefan should be our new nickname as a unit. Yeah, it should be. Yes. 